Hello. We're talking about socialization and the age of the internet uh, this week, and I just have a couple of reminders as we get started that you have an online quiz due on Sunday, and if you have any questions about that, um, I uh, am available, 913-553-0267. There should be a quiz study guide under files, so that will help you, and of course you can use the files to take the quiz as these are to help prepare you for the exam. I also want to say that I had uh, scheduled or sent out uh, on our module this week that we are going to do a collaboration or a conference session. Um, I'm going to schedule that for next week, and if you can keep your eyes, um, if you keep yourself posted, I do record those, but I'd prefer for you to show up for those if you can find the time that all of us can uh, get together for about half an hour to 45 minutes uh, sometime next week to talk about the final project. I'll be able to go over that um, and ask any questions that you might have. Um, and then also to ask questions about the exams that are coming up. So let's get started. Um, I don't know how many of you present yourself in a particular way um, to other people. It may be different when you're one-on-one -on -one with a person in a room versus one-on-one -on, -one on chat room. But we do recognize in this day and age of the internet that uh, we have lots of different ways of presenting ourselves. I, have a gamer for a husband and it's really funny half the fun i think for him for video games is to figure out uh, what his avatar is going to look like um and i think i felt the same way uh when i've played online games you don't necessarily like to present images that are exactly who you are um, but there are also times where it's very important for us to realize we need to be aware of the self that we present Irving Goffman is one of our top sociologists that deals with uh, how we look at that. Um, he's a symbolic interactionist, and so he often will look at the symbols and the ways in which we create masks. And his quote today is, choose your self-presentations carefully. What starts out as a mask may become your face. And that is very true. I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience where you present yourself maybe in a better light. I think that's typical when we're introducing ourselves to people. And then sometimes people realize that we have flaws. We notice that about others as well. Or we may present ourselves as um, worse than we are. And that's something that people don't keep in mind, that sometimes we're afraid to share who we are and then people discover things about us. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, it's usually a role that you're presenting, something that you've been socialized in, as we remember last week's lecture. There are times where we are taking on roles that have been given to the me over time. Um, somebody is helping us decide who we are going to be at a very early age. And then as we start to take on self-identity, um, we start to recognize one, the roles that we've been given, and two, maybe the roles that we want to change. The experience behavior of people occupying that particular position is what we technically call a role. For example, think about the role of governor versus the role of soccer mom versus electrician. All of those have different levels of gendering, status. Sometimes we think of an income or lack of income. We often don't recognize our roles uh, in that multiple way where you're taking on several different masks and separate, several different roles all at once. Um, but that's a very important part of our socialized life to get used to those multiple roles and to understand that we change or present ourselves differently with each one. One way in which we present that or may experience the difference in a role is the change in status. For example, um, I have several different roles that I play uh, based on my occupation. I'm a pastor, so when I've served in the church or been in front of people as a religious representative or clergy, my role is often seen as, you know, being something more reverent. However, if you meet me as a friend, hanging out, having a beer, I may not necessarily be as reverent. But then as I present myself as daughter to my mom or my dad, I may try to back off a little bit, but still not be as formal as what I've presented as a clergy. And then finally, as a teacher, I try to be uh, somewhat engaging and, and try to connect people to the material. And so there may be a bit of formality mixed with uh, a little less um, sense of uh, reverence. Maybe that's the best word. So status is a social honor or prestige, and you 
feel that sometimes that status that has been put on to that particular role by a group and members of society. Think of it this way. If you're president of a car club, people are probably not going to teach, treat you the same way as if you're president of the United States. So society has put, obviously, a high level of status on president of the United States, even though president of a car club may be something even more fun and a lot more rewarding. Um, chair of a board versus chair of a committee. It depends on the status of the group itself. If you're chair of a board, usually the status is that you have large power economics to consider um, or some sort of uh, funding. Whereas if you're chair of a committee, you may not have any funding. It may be just to create some sort of action over time. All our roles interact and uh, with wealth, ownership, all of these things are interacting at the same time. So status is not um associated always with wealth or ownership it can always be something um, that is based on what the group finds important so let's say you're a fire chief you may be a volunteer fire chief there may be no funds involved in that you may not gain any wealth but you gain a sense of that status from the community and so that prestige and honor become a source of power and resource for you Whereas a person who's a principal at a school um, may not necessarily make a lot of money, but because they've taught most of the kids in the area, they may gain a high level of status. So we need to recognize that status isn't always based on economics. All our roles interact and we change our roles accordingly. So it, this is something to keep in mind, especially when we're talking in social theory, uh, we call this impression management. When we prepare for the presentation of one social role, there is a video. I really want you to watch that. I'm going to invite you to interact about that video uh, this week in your post. Um, impression management is it's key for us understanding how we change our role based on what we're expecting out of, of the rewards that we're going to receive. Um, and sometimes we present ourselves, for example, for an interview or for meeting people that we want to impress differently than when we're just being around our everyday friends. A social interaction is a process by which we act and react to those around us. And so that impression changes differently based on the reactions that we're uh, experiencing. Um, we also have agency, which is a very important part of our self-awareness of those roles. It, it's a sense of being able to think and act and make choices independently. And so when you're young and being socialized, you tend to not have a lot of agency, meaning people are making decisions for you. As you gain your uh, into, if, as you gain uh, years of experience and become older, you tend to find yourself gaining more agency or are expected to take on more agency and make more decisions for yourself. And finally, when you're an adulthood, hopefully there's a level of agency that you feel. However, all of us at some time have limited agency based on the roles that we're expected to play. And so sometimes you can't make a decision or it's not easily made without somebody sanctioning or giving you a negative sanction uh, if you act and think without uh, thinking about the society that you're interacting with and the impression that that makes. Irving Goffman called this the dramaturgical model and basically to think of it like Shakespeare, all the world's a stage. Everything is out there and you're just connecting to this stage based on the roles that you're playing at the time, are you at the front of the stage, back of the stage, or are you being seen on stage? And what's your performance? I want you to think about, for example, today, when you're walking around, what roles are you playing? How are you stepping in and out of those roles? What does it look like? Do you dress differently? Do you talk differently? Um, do people react to you differently? What's the performance that's going on? Irving Goffman also says it's important for us to study this because our day-to-day -day routines tell us about the structure of, of life itself. And so when we're studying uh, things with the sociological imagination, when we study society in this way, we are trying to get the idea of what the norms, the values, and everything is based on how the performances are going. It reveals to us how humans can act creatively and shape reality. So sometimes we change our roles based on things that happen to us. For example, Hurricanes are being talked about on the East Coast. That's going to change the way in which people interact for the next several weeks as those uh, play out. If it makes landfall, it will change uh, the perspective of how uh, 
people's roles and status uh, are experienced because there may be emergency personnel that suddenly are ranked higher so that they can get into certain zones and areas, whereas other citizens are uh, sent to different places because their role is not to help but to survive. So it reveals that we can adapt to things and um, then we try to return to some sort of norm or if we have to adapt, we adapt. It also sheds light on how our social systems work in our institutions. So for example, we recognize that we are students and so our form of how we're interacting is online. You're watching videos, you're connecting with each other versus posts. That looks very different than if you're in the classroom and the system and the institution is based on that one-on-one, -on -one. but the same expectation of being graded and evaluated is there. So it sheds light on how, you know, the system may be adapted, but how we're making that happen um, is something that symbolic interactionism and um, the dramaturgical model can give us an idea of the symbols and the language. The other thing is to recognize that we have lots of nonverbal communication and um, there's times where things are going on that we don't even notice. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a friend sometimes staring off in space um, and you're kind of like, they're ignoring me, but they may be actually thinking about something or maybe even listening to you, but you take that nonverbal communication in a particular way. Our body language, uh, how we look at each other, our facial expressions, it's just important for us to be aware of. Now, there are certain things with nonverbal communication that we also could do. For example, we can have rude and lewd gestures. If I hold up my middle finger to all of you right now, you would probably be shocked, first of all, and then second, you would be able to read a symbol into that. What is that? But it's a finger on a hand. However, we've given it some sense of communication because it is a symbol. It also means different things in different countries. Um, and so people may not have the same symbols in the same body language. Facial expressions may be unintentional as well. There's a lot of times people look at each other and they try to figure out their face, what's going on up here. And honestly, some people don't have the same types of expressions, but we try to read them anyway. Um, think about these faces of, as we look, what's this guy looking like, you know, disgust or he can't stand what he's seeing that is sometimes an automatic reaction and we can tell you know that's not a happy look that's that's a what is going on look uh, when we look at different types of faces for example a girl crying um, gives us a sense there's something wrong something's going on or this young guy uh, just you know shocked or frightened and we can always tell the difference between sometimes the super happy when a person's got a huge um, smile on their face versus somebody who's angry or mad. Now, one thing we would need to recognize, though, is that sometimes people are aware that they can put these faces on. And when we're studying society, we have to recognize that people have expectations put upon them as to how they're supposed to look. So keep that in mind if you're doing a social uh, study of a society or a group or or doing some sort of observation that even though people can look like these expressions and bring these expressions forward, they may not necessarily be um, feeling that inside. And that's an important aspect of our research is to get at the truth of what people are experiencing, but also the truth of what they're uh, presenting um, as both, both of these as social facts. They may be presenting and, and what that presentation is, is a social fact, and also there may be something internally going on inside. Um, motivationally, we have to think about the importance of role and um, what's going on there. And then we add emojis. <laughs> How do, I, mean, I don't know about you, but every time I get a new emoji update, I'm excited. I probably go and use every single one of the emojis as quickly as I can with my friends. Um, but we use these interactions as ways to express our facial expressions without seeing our face. And so, um, although there's emoji apps that make your face the emoji. So it's a form of our agency that we use when we're on the internet um, so that people can see how we're choosing to feel. So think about, you know, how you send these things. If you send this to a friend, 
it can be seen very differently versus if it's sent to your mother or if you send this to a friend versus your mother, the way they react might be very different. Um, the same is true about these two, you know. Um, think about what these emojis mean. Does this mean you're cool? Or is it, I, I am cool with that? Or, you know, your interpretation of that emoji and knowing how the other person's gonna interpret that is something we evaluate. Of course, I use this a lot with my friends uh, to, to laugh out loud and to just be, you know, thinking about cracking up because they sent me something funny, some sort of video or whatever. Um, and, you know, some people, if they were sent a video and let's say they didn't think it was funny and you sent this back, it could have a very different reaction. Of course, there's our ice cream cone, um, which a lot of people do not use for an ice cream cone. Supposedly, it's chocolate ice cream, but you can interpret that however you want. Gestures are also intended uh, to help us understand meaning, um, nodding, shrugging, telling off. You can see what people do and, and take that into account when you're seeing how we interact with each other based on gestures. And gestures are very different in, in regional areas. So you have to recognize that a gesture in Italy is going to be very different just gesture in Hawaii versus Russia, you know, wherever you're at, you have to recognize what those gestures are. And especially keep in mind that if, especially you're in a community that's not um, your uh, primary place of, of being, that there may be different gestures. The other thing about social roles is that those defined expectations of an individual in a given status are uh, something that keep us within a structure. And sometimes we call that uh, somewhat of an iron cage, a place where those roles can have boundaries, but those boundaries are only this far. And when you break those boundaries, it may have a, a, a sanction that you're not expecting. So for example, a couple of years ago, uh, Peyton Manning, you know, um, receives this amazing major uh, joy of winning a Super Bowl and um, I often say what would happen if Peyton Manning decided to kneel and um, with the debate that we have right now the roles that that person is is you know presenting that person is presenting has this national title and this very Americanized idea of who we are and so that role is not expected to have any social commentary on um, some of the, the national issues that we have considering race and economic um, uh, viability in this world. But then Beyonce was the halftime entertainment. And of course, she comes out after, uh, it was after a major shooting uh, from a police officer to a youth that was of color. And she is dressed like a Black Panther, and she is coming to town with her performance. Well, she is in a social role where that is expected. Our, our entertainers are often expected to be uh, pushing the boundaries. The arts and, and that type of place is, is a place where that is allowed. So compare those two roles, knowing that they're on the same football field, and they're both having uh, different kinds of expectations from their roles in that position and how they present that. Structure is also something we have to recognize that we are surrounded by, and it's a recurrent pattern of those arrangements and hierarchies that influence and limit our cho choices based on the opportunities available to us. So going back to Peyton and um, Beyonce, um, you know, there's a structure of football players versus a structure of entertainers. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I think that's the main reason that we see people re uh, react emotionally. Uh, to each one of those roles. And so we have to recognize that with our family structures, our school structures, our work structures, our leisure structures. They're all out there and there's bound, there are boundaries in which the, the societal norms um, will often be set. And if you break those structures or go against that with your own agency, um, you may actually experience a negative or positive sanction. Sometimes stretching the structure can uh, be lifted up. Uh, it just depends on the role that you're playing. And that often comes into play with social position, the uh, social identity an individual has been given in a group or society 
where there's a general nat nature about that position. It's not just about status, you know, it's about the position that you hold is an identity that is expected with that and the individual has to recognize their position in society. You've heard people say that before. Um, if you're a teacher, for example, you have a position in society to be interested in kids' education, be concerned about those things. Um, your position, however, as a father or a mother may look different, um, but society has put some terms on that social position and it's not just a role you play, it's a position that gives you an idea of the structure, the hierarchy, and the bureaucracy, and how we've set that up. So then you tend to have this idea of the social self, where you, um, like we were talking about earlier, um, with your social identity, you recognize and are self-conscious as a human individual that uh, your self-identity is conferred upon by other people outside of you. You've gotten this sense of self-identity based on this uh, response or connection to people. And uh, you present that social self. And like Irving Goffman would say, you present it on that front stage and it would be something that people could see, but it may not be your self-identity that's coming through there. It may be something that you have uh, had constructed for you in conjunction with you getting used to what that role is supposed to look like. We become self-conscious then if we're playing that role and we challenge that role with something that may or may not necessarily um, be uh, expected. Um, it may be something that a lot of people have, have a struggle with. Um, if they want to change a role, um, that self-consciousness of doing that is gonna be usually heightened, which is that awareness, that distinct social identity. Um, and it's, something that you might have some agency that you can change, but when you do that, you're aware that you're doing that. There are a lot of things we do in our interaction, however, that we're not aware of, um, we're not paying attention to. For example, civil in intention is where we are, for example, walking down the road and you know you're with a bunch of people, you're with tons of people, in fact, and there's no sense that you are paying attention really to people, but you have an idea that you're walking on a certain side of the road. Let's say you come to an intersection, you guys, you all recognize the light as red or green or yellow. You walk together across. There's a sense of in a process where you're in that same physical setting and you demonstrate to each other that you're aware of that presence, but you're not necessarily interacting. You're not trying to really even give a, social impression you're just doing life with other people and recognizing that there are certain rules that you're you're going by so you'll notice for example in this picture that there are people going one direction and people going the other direction and some people stopped but you know all things kind of have this one-way direction um, in which you can see people conforming to those rules and focus interaction is where you're among people uh, in present in a particular setting and not engaged in face-to-face -face communication. For example, if you go to a rock concert or some sort of a festival, I'm gonna go to the Bluegrass Festival this weekend. I'm gonna be with thousands of people that I do not know, but uh, we are uh, in the same place, so we probably have some things in common. And if I ran into that person, um, say at the grocery store and found out that they had been at the festival too, we could probably talk about some of the same things. Um, so it's not direct and face-to-face -face communication, but we're picking up some of the same symbols and same experiences. Focused interaction then is where you are working uh, to really be engaged with that person face-to-face. -face. So let's say I'm at that same festival, but I'm with somebody and we're both experiencing, you know, we're going to the same stages to listen to the same people. Um, we're connecting about what we want to do with our day. We may be deciding that we want to get uh, some sort of lunch together or uh, take a break and come back. That is focused interaction where we're face-to-face we're -face and we're intending to have direct conversation with each other and organize that. An encounter is a meeting between two or more people in a situation. So this is often where I say 
um, where I have had that focused uh, interaction, you have deeper focus when you're in an encounter. So the intent is really to be with that person. Maybe it's a date, maybe it's coffee with a friend, um, maybe you're studying together. And that encounter is something that is a, a little bit more of an intentional meeting, not so loose as just having face-to-face -face interaction. You learn to segregate, by the way, all the different roles that you play. For example, I want to give an example of, let's say it's the Bluegrass Festival this weekend. Um, I may be there with family members and have focused interaction with all of those that are present. We'll work in and out of that day that we're at the festival. Um, I will, however, be engaged with unfocused interaction with other people. Uh, that are present maybe in the stadium or in the seats um, and then there's going to be a lot of civil intention when it comes to that say the concert or one of the stage lets out for its concert and I'm going to another stage people are going to be crossing uh, across the same paths and trying to keep on same sides of the road and then there's times where for example i may want to hang out with my husband and just talk for a few minutes and um, really be focused in on that experience and that's more of an encounter we might say hey let's do lunch and we'll, we'll check in um, and really pay attention to that we'll set a time and date for that so that's how that segregation works and it often takes on the many roles you're doing this all the time. When we create space for different forms of identity and certain peoples uh, and groups, we're, we're going between audience participant to um, being um, our own selves, maybe as a daughter or a spouse, um, and then changing it up and being part of a large group that uh, isn't really focused on anything but, you know, trying to not run into each other. So that's what audience segregation is, we're doing it constantly in college, you do it a lot. And conversation analysis allows us to really look at the whole thing. Um, sometimes that's with body language, sometimes it's with our understanding of um, the words and the symbols that are being used, and it's an ethnomethodology, meaning we're getting out into the direct community, trying to understand the social roles and the status and the positions that are out there and the language that's attributed to that and then seeing how uh, people talk and that role and that reproduction of that role and that social order continue to be something that uh, through conversation and watching we see it either reified meaning people are trying to you know keep it going and um, and or uh, as conflict theorists might say they might try to disrupt it and change it over time and this is where the fun comes in. As a sociologist, you can do things sometimes to deliberately mess the structure up. For example, uh, if people have noticed at election time, there's a phenomenon called trolling, and it's, it's where people are often not even really interested in an outcome of the election as much as they are in disrupting the whole thing. Now, there are some that are very intentionally trolling to uh, get the, uh, outcome to change, <clears throat> but it's important for us to rec recognize interactional vandalism is something we deliberately do uh, of, ta to, of the tacit roles of, of conversation, that we are breaking them, um, and we're trying to uh, interrupt something, and sometimes it can be very damaging. For example, catcalling. People may think that's not uh, something that feels <clears throat> that invasive, except when you're a female, for example, or a male, walking down the road, and something somebody says something like that, um, it, may, it may make you uneasy. Sorry, I had to take a little break. <clears throat> but there's a lot of times where um, when people play with you a little bit, they're sometimes doing a little bit of vandalism just to see what you, you'll do to react. So then there's a lot of times where <clears throat> we recognize in our am analysis that personal place plays a real <coughs> sorry personal space uh, can be something we study as well 
body language is often uh, not just about gestures, not just about nonverbals, but it can be about what the body's doing and how people are interacting. And you can tell sometimes uh, how that role is um, maybe intimate or not so intimate and very impersonal. Look at things like eye contact to understand personal space, you know, are people uh, staring too long or looking at people too long? Are they touching? Are they not touching? Do they have a certain personal bubble around them? How are they speaking within that space? Are they whispering? Are they talking um, to where they're trying to keep the conversation between themselves? Or are they trying to do something where, you know, they're very public and they're trying to keep it, you know, um, to where it's not so intimate? So, uh, we study personal space a lot of times when we're looking at uh, how people interact and, and we can tell a lot from that personal space and how it's experienced. Then there's also compulsion of proximity, which is people's needs to interact, need to interact with others in their presence. Um, and sometimes taking into account the type of person and the expectation of the role and the social position that this person has. Um, and so there's a lot of times that, um, for example, men and women in public, um, they may do things that uh, reflect that, that role. Men sometimes still try to pull doors open. Um, but now we start seeing women do that a lot more. But that traditional role, um, that compulsion to uh, live out the expected gendering uh, is something that we often see. Sometimes our uh, experience of uh, people of different color and different um, race or ethnicity may create different forms of reaction to each other. We may be more self-aware of our language or not so self-aware of our language. And uh, that's something that is based on recognizing that difference and, and the compulsion to try to address it. And, and just uh, our bodies sometimes give away things or our nonverbal language even. Um, and then there's a time where we also, uh, as sociologists, we'll, we'll go out and, and test that. And so we do breaching experience, experiments where we're intentionally breaking social rules. And these are difficult to do without offending people. So a lot of times if you do a breaching experiment in the society, or in the society, there's people working outside. Um, if you do a breaching experiment, experiment uh, on campus you have to ask for permission to do it um, if you're doing that for some sort of um, a class typically they will hand out a form for you to be able to turn in um, to say that you're doing everything to keep those human subjects aware that they're part of a, 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 an experiment um, or maybe do some sort of debriefing afterwards but when you intentionally break social rules, it can be as simple as um, sitting too close to somebody and seeing how they react. It can be uh, doing something uh, completely offensive, like using um, offensive language and seeing how people react. And that can get you in trouble if you do that. But it's it's something that breaching experiments are intended to to really go against the norms and see how people react to that. One of those reactions might be a response cry. Um, what are you doing? Or, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that. Or, you know, uh, things that just are involuntary that come out that basically shock you. And sometimes it can be um, happy and sometimes, you know, shocked going along with those facial expressions. And sometimes it can be, um, you know, really uh, like, you are taken off guard and and so you may cuss you may um, have an expletive or two and so response cries are often another way to see how people react because uh, it comes out and and it's you know causing some sort of involuntary reaction finally we're getting to the last parts of the the lecture today um, when we're studying interactions with people whether internet whether face to face whether in groups whether at bluegrass festivals, we have to recognize that we are shaped by time. Things happen at different times. And time space is when and where events occur. So you may have a totally different experience of uh, observing people 
at noon versus eight o'clock at night. Um, and there's rationalization that we have all these different regional time zones and settings and people have gotten used to them. Um, but when you're in another culture, sometimes even though we may have an international uh, time zone, um, that doesn't mean that everybody is going by that. So you have to recognize that you may be studying a culture um, that doesn't necessarily go by that. But recognize that in the group and, and then see uh, if it's being rationalized. And then also recognize that we use clocks to often um, measure what time something is happening in terms of hours, minutes, and seconds. And so um, that helps us to um, be able to put a parameter around it, maybe days, weeks, months. And, and when we're doing studies of, of people, we often want to recur, recur uh, as much as possible the uh, setting. Um, and that reoccurrence help us, uh, helps us to uh, see if it continues to be a pattern or not. Um, and so when we're studying those interactions, we have to keep that in mind. I hope you're aware, uh, don't become self-aware or self-conscious as much, but um, that as we study society, we have to be very conscious of how we look at our positions, our roles, and how we present ourselves on that stage, both front and backstage. Please pay attention to that video um, on uh, Irving Goffman and the presentation of self. That's really important for this week, um, and I look forward to your posts. Oh, by the way, again, if you need me, um, phone number 913-553-0267, and you can text me anytime. Have a good week.